Welcome back to Math 11a. So we've seen a lot of derivatives and a lot of derivative rules lately, and today I'm going to start out by kind of reviewing um, and compiling a lot of these things that we've learned, and we'll learn maybe just one or two new things uh, related to exponential and logarithmic functions. We might get to something called uh, logarithmic differentiation today. So that's where we're going, um, and we'll start with a table of functions. So just to kind of warm up again, I've made a list of functions on the left column, and these are functions where you should be able to, with a little practice, just write down the derivatives um, almost immediately, you know, within, say, 10 seconds or so. It takes some practice, but it's worth working on these. And if you want, it might be a good time to kind of pause the video and see how many of these functions you can just immediately write down what the derivative is. So pause it, give it a try, and then I'll show you the answers. Okay, now for the answers. So the first two functions here, 17 and pi, these are both constant functions. So these are both constant functions. I mean, they don't really look like functions at all. Their graphs, if you graph them, they just look like horizontal lines. Their y-coordinates are different. This is a horizontal line that's located at y equals 17. And this is a horizontal that's lo line that's located at y equals pi. In either case, though, horizontal lines have zero slope. They're completely flat. And therefore, the derivative in both cases is zero. The derivative of constant functions is zero. Now, the pi throws some people off because, well, pi looks a little different than 17. But pi is still constant. So is e. So is e to the square root of pi. All sorts of things are constants. They can just look a little complicated. Now x, y equals x is a linear function, and so is 3x plus 2. So y equals x, the graph of that is a line of slope 1, and the graph of 3x plus 2 is a line of larger slope, it's slope 3. I don't really care about the y-intercept right now. The slope is 3 for the line y equals 3x plus 2, and the slope is 1 for the line y equals x. Therefore, the derivative is a constant function for both of these. The derivative doesn't change as I move along this line. The slope doesn't change. The derivative is 1 everywhere I look over here, and the derivative is 3 everywhere I look along this line. So linear functions, you can see the slope, you can see the derivative almost without using any calculus, just by the slope interpretation of the derivative. Now x squared is maybe the first interesting example. I think it's the first example that I worked out. The derivative, we drop the power down and decrease it by 1, and we're left with 2x. This is a parabola, and 2x describes a line, and the fact that this line is going upwards reflects the fact that the slope is going upwards as I travel along this line. The slope starts being negative, then the slope is zero, and then the slope is positive. The line, it starts off below the x-axis, it starts off negative, and then zero, and then positive. So the slope of the parabola is described by the line y equals 2x. If f of x equals x squared, then f prime of x, the slope where the derivative is 2x. This is something that is maybe um, what well, we figured out using the limit definition of the derivative. Uh, slopes of parabolas were actually considered for a long time, uh, so the ancient Greeks were aware of the slopes of tangent lines to parabolas. I think this can be found in Apollonius around 200 BC. Now the square root of x is the first one that might be a little bit tricky, and one way to figure out its derivative is to phrase this in terms of an exponent. The square root of x is really x to the 1 half. So we can use the power rule to bring down the 1 half and decrease that exponent by 1. And the derivative is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And some people would like to put this in terms of square roots again. So we can rewrite this as 1 over 2 times the square root of x. I jumped maybe a couple steps in going from left to right here. 
The negative exponent puts this down on the bottom of a fraction. The one half puts it in the square root, and then I kind of multiply my fractions together to get from left to right. Okay, and this one, notice the domain of the square root function. It consists of only the positive real numbers and zero. So it kind of has a little endpoint here. The same thing is true here, except for the fact that when x is zero, the slope is undefined. So notice the domain here, uh, the domain is zero infinity, including zero. And here the domain of the derivative is does not include zero. It goes from zero to infinity, not including zero. And the reason why, the reason why you kind of lose zero from the domain is that the tangent line at zero is actually vertical here. So the uh, derivative is not defined at zero. Well, also it, it's not defined because you need a two-sided limit and there's no way to approach from the left. There's kind of a few reasons, I guess, why the derivative is not defined at zero. And the derivative is this function one over two root x. When x is zero, this is not defined. Also when x is negative, this is not defined. Now we have the function one over x. Again, this is kind of a archetype function. You should know what the graph looks like off the top of your head. This is a hyperbola. This graph looks kind of like this. And to figure out its derivative, again, I'd express this as an exponent. This is x to the negative one. And so we can bring the power down, negative one times x to the decrease that exponent by one to get negative two. Or I usually drop off the one and just write negative x to the negative two. Or if I like fractions, I'd say that's negative one over x squared. And here, the derivative looks like this. Notice the derivative is always below the x-axis. The derivative is always negative. That reflects the fact that in this graph, the slope is always negative. No matter where you stand on this graph, you're always going downhill. No matter where you stand, you're going downhill. So the slope is negative. So the derivative is always negative and it's undefined at zero. Now sine of x, that was maybe the most difficult derivative we computed. And you don't need to remember why this is true. It's a kind of a difficult proof, but it's good to know what the derivative is. The derivative is cosine of x, kind of miraculously. So sine goes up, down, up, down. It passes through the origin. The derivative is cosine of x. And the cosine of x starts up at one and then does the same up, down kind of pattern. In fact, the graph of cosine of x is the same as the graph of sine of x, just shifted. Well, shifted to the left by pi over 2 or to the right by 3 pi over 2. There's lots of ways of shifting this left or right to get cosine of x. And the derivative of cosine of x, I don't think I proved this, but the proof is about as hard as the proof for a sine. So here's cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. It's a common mistake people make to just write sine of x, but there's a little minus here. So this one, negative sine of x, the graph looks a lot like sine of x, but it goes kind of downhill first before it wobbles up and down and up and down, just like sine. e to the x is that amazing function, which is its own derivative. e to the x is always above the x-axis. It has this kind of point where it hits the y-axis, this kind of landmark point at 0, 1. And the slope there is 1. And the derivative is, well, the exact same thing. It's always above the x-axis. And it has the same landmark point, 0, 1, reflecting the fact that that slope here is 1. And I believe last time I showed you what the derivative of the natural logarithm of x is. It's 1 over x. Natural logarithm is only defined when x is greater than 0. It has a vertical asymptote here. And 1 over x, I should say it's this function when x is greater than 0. So it's 
kind of part of the hyperbola. So the derivative is only exists when x is greater than zero. So maybe I should write one over x, but restricted to the domain x greater than zero. The derivative of natural logarithm is not defined when x is negative, and therefore we really shouldn't say the derivative is one over x without qualifying that statement by saying that's only true when x is greater than zero. So here's a big list of functions and the derivatives, and a little bit about them. You should be able to remember what the graphs look like, know some landmark points, and be able to figure out the derivatives uh, pretty quickly. Maybe there's a little algebra that takes time, but at least being able to convert and then take the derivative shouldn't take too long. Um, this is the mechanical kind of fluency involved in learning calculus and being ready for your future classes where you're going to use this. Now I want to do a similar exercise, but instead of taking functions where you should be able to just kind of look at it and find the derivative, I want to look at functions where you might have to look at it and decide on the rule that you're going to use to find the derivative. Now, the functions I've chosen are here on the left, and this is a good time for you to pause uh, just for maybe a minute and look at the functions and see if you can identify not the derivative right away, but at least the rules that you're going to need to use to figure out the derivative. So take a minute and go through all of these functions and figure out which rule or rules you're going to need to figure out the derivatives. And now I'll show you what the rules are and I'll find the derivatives. So for a polynomial like this, this is a polynomial function. I guess the rules that I would use, technically speaking, are the power rule, because I see some powers of x here, the constant multiple rule, because I see constants like 3 times that power, and the addition rule. And that's kind of a formal way of looking at this, and maybe also like the fact that constants have derivative 0. I'm not sure if that's called the constant rule or not, but that's a little fact too. So all these rules together, when I look at this, I don't think to myself, okay, I'm going to use a power rule here and the constant multiple rule here, etc. With polynomials, you should just practice them until you can do them pretty quickly in your head. So for this, um, all these techniques get used for polynomials, and you can kind of do them all at once. So the way that I do this is I look at the powers, I bring them down, so 7 gets multiplied on the left, so that's 21, and that power gets decreased to 6. And then the next term, here I'm using the addition rule, is the sum of the derivatives, then I put a plus, and then the derivative of 4x is 4, because it's a linear function. And then next I have plus 0, the derivative of 1 is 0, and so I just don't include it. Okay, so with a little practice, you can just write down the derivatives. And if you want some activity to do, and this is really nice with, um, you know, if you've got a partner, you could make a friend in the class or something. It's really easy to write down polynomials. Just choose some constants and some powers of x and add them together. You can even use fractional powers of x if you want. But choose a polynomial and give it to your partner to take the derivative. And then trade and see if uh, you both agree on the answer. If you do, you're probably right. Um, but there are some common mistakes, like a lot of people make a mistake and move this 1 straight over there, forgetting that the derivative of 1 is 0. Or they might replace the 4 and the 3 by 0 because derivatives of constants are 0. Uh, but that's a mistake because constant multiple rule says that that constant just gets transferred over, the 4 just gets transferred over to a 4 when it's multiplied by some uh, function like x. Okay, now for some... Uh, more isolated examples. For a function like sine of x plus the natural logarithm of x, the only rule that I think you need is the addition rule. And the derivative is going to be the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x, plus the derivative of natural logarithm of x, which is 1 over x. Here, for sine of x, natural logarithm of x, 
multiplied together. Remember, there's no space between, there's, there's no symbol. So that stands for multiplication. Here we use the product rule. So this is like my f and this is my g. I need an f prime g, which is a cosine of x, natural logarithm of x. Then I need the first function times the derivative of the second, which is sine of x times one over x. And I usually would write this sine of x over x. Notice that it's not cosine of x times 1 over x. So it's not cosine of x times 1 over x because that's not how derivatives work. The derivative of, of a product is not the derivative of the first thing times the derivative of the second thing. It's more complicated. You have to use the product rule. Here, I would use the quotient rule. Well, let me put it this way. I would use the quotient rule if I have a book nearby to look it up. Otherwise, I would use the product rule. Let me show you how I would use the product rule because personally, I just hate the quotient rule. I, I never remember what it is. So for the product rule, I'd express this as sine of x times x inverse, or x inverse sine of x. And now I have the product of two things whose derivatives I can figure out. So I find it's the derivative of the first, which is negative x to the negative 2 times sine of x, plus the first thing, x inverse cosine of x. And if I really want, I can kind of simplify this a little bit. Um, this, in fact, is equal to, if I do this right, this will be something like x cosine of x minus sine of x all divided by x squared. This is probably what you'd see if you actually used the quotient rule. Um, either one of these is fine with me, and I hope that WebAssign would accept either one of these as a correct answer. Now this one, the natural log of the sine of x, Notice that one function is kind of stuck inside of another. This is a sign that you should use the chain rule. In this one, it's kind of obvious. Sometimes the chain rule isn't so obvious in the sense that you don't have parentheses around an inner function within kind of an outer function there. But this one is meant to be really shout at you, chain rule. So this one, I, I hope that you can see this and it shouts to you, use the chain rule. Um, we'll do some more with chain rule that aren't so obvious, uh, just in a few minutes. To figure out the derivative, well, this is like our f of g of x. So we write down f prime of g of x times the derivative of g. So this would be the derivative of natural logarithm is the 1 over function. So 1 over sine of x times the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. I could write this as cosine of x over sine of x. And some people would write this as the cotangent of x. Now for this class, you might have noticed that the book uh, discusses all six trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. I've really focused on sine and cosine because those are the fundamental ones. Uh, and for the applications that I think are most relevant for this class, life sciences and economics, sine and cosine are really probably enough trigonometry for you. Um, but you might see this quotient cosine over sine rephrased as cotangent. Uh, either one is fine with me. I've purposefully avoided the homework questions that involve these other trigonometric functions because it's just not what I want to focus on in the class. So if you can just get to the point where you write cosine of x over sine of x, then I think you're in good shape. Okay, what about the last one? Well, the last one, you have a product, x times sine of x. You have a quotient, you have that stuff over x plus 1. That big function is kind of inside of the e to the blank function, so there's a chain rule. 
and you have a power here, x to the pi is a power of x, and then you have a sum of things. So for something like this, uh, if I wanted to take the time, I would have to use all of the above rules. So um, I write this down because uh, life doesn't really come at you in isolated rules like this. Maybe it's the difference between if you go to the gym and you, you know, you work out your calves one day and your biceps another day and your traps another day or something like that. Uh, that's not going to translate to really doing much out in the field unless you kind of do something out on the field every now and then. So learning these rules are kind of learning skills in isolation. But when you actually have to figure out derivatives, if you ever do, if you ever take some more applied classes, which are quantitative in nature, uh, well, you're not going to necessarily have to use all the rules, not some bizarre function like this, but usually you have to use maybe a few rules to figure out the derivative of what you care about. Um, so I'll do some more realistic examples uh, just next. One thing that I saw in the surveys was a lot of students having trouble with the chain rule, when to use it, how to know how to use it in a way. So when to use it, how to use it, how to recognize when you have to use it, those kind of issues. So I wanted to show you some different examples of when you'd use the chain rule, just to give you an idea of the diversity of functions that you might see which, uh, for which the chain rule applies. Uh, I don't have any easy answers if you're wondering for kind of a general rule, when should I use the chain rule? Unfortunately, there is no sort of general rule like that. So calculus is kind of a strategy game. Uh, you might try different strategies and some work better than others. And it's something where it really takes a lot of practice, pen and paper, uh, practice and time, until you develop the, the skill to recognize which strategies might work in a problem and which ones don't. Um, it makes math more interesting, uh, more challenging, and we're not in the time anymore where you can just look up the formula uh, and it's obvious which one to use and how to use it. So let me show you some uh, more examples though, because practice is key here. All of these functions you can figure out the derivative by using the chain rule. And in order to use the chain rule, you have to be able to express your function, whatever you're given, as something of the form f of g of x. And this was on your homework, maybe in week one or something, given a bunch of functions to express them as f of g of x and to write down the corresponding functions f and g. Now in this example, I've tried to make it pretty obvious because this looks like f of g of x f is the natural logarithm and g is the sine. So f of x is the natural logarithm of x and g of x is the sine of x. Notice that I'm using x in here rather than sine of x. The function is the natural logarithm and I just want to know what the function is when x is input. So here, this is f of g of x. The function f is the natural logarithm and instead of plugging in x, I've plugged in g of x. I've plugged in the sine of x as my input to the natural logarithm of x, and that gets me natural logarithm of sine of x. That's how I've broken this function down as a composition of functions. f of g of x. So this is how you pronounce this. This is f of g of x is how I would say it. In other words, I take the input, I perform the function g, to that input, and then I perform f to the result. The derivative by the chain rule, so this is always going to be something like f prime of g of x times g prime of x. That's the chain rule. It says the derivative is given by this formula. So the derivative of, of f is the 1 over x function. So I have 1 over g of x, which is 1 over sine of x times g prime of x, the derivative of sine is cosine of x, which is the cosine of x over the sine of x, also called the cotangent, but I'll leave it like that. Now here, this might be a little bit more difficult. I don't see any parentheses in here, for example. So I have to be a little bit more creative in deciding what my function f and g are. And for this, I can think of this process that I'd use to compute this value if I knew x. If I knew what x was, the first thing I would do is add 1, and the second thing I would do is I would take the square root of the result. 
So my f, I'll take the square root function. So, it, well, f of x will equal the square root of x. And the function g, I'll take the function 1 plus x. Because then if I do 1 plus x and I take the square root of the result, I get the square root of 1 plus x. The derivative is f prime. Now f prime is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. So I have 1 half something to the negative 1 half, and that something should be g, g of x. So that's g of x. That's my f prime of g of x. Then I have g prime of x. The derivative of g of x is 1. Because the derivative of 1 is 0, the derivative of x is 1. And I could simplify this if I like. The simplification is 1 over 2 square root of 1 plus x. Using my laws of exponents, I kind of prefer square roots to fractional exponents when I can. Um, but this is perfectly good. Maybe I'd get rid of the times 1 because that doesn't really do much for me. Now e to the 3x. Kind of a similar problem to this. I think about this as a process. If I wanted to know e to the 3x, then I'd first multiply x by 3. Then I'd take e to the result. So my first step in the process is figuring out 3x. And my second step is taking e to that result. e to the 3x is f of g of x. Now to figure out the derivative, f prime. f prime of x is just e to the x again. So it's e to the g of x, which is 3x. And then I multiply by g prime of x, which is 3. And I like my constants to be first, so I write 3e to the 3x. Now how about this one? Here, if I want to figure out this messy quantity, I start with my x. I could figure out x squared plus 1 as my first step, and then take the result to the 2020th power. So the first thing I do is I compute x squared plus 1, and the second thing I do is I take the result to the 2020th power. To figure out the derivative, I take the derivative of f, which is 2020, well, x to the 2019, I decrease the exponent by 1, but my input is g of x to the 2019. So that's my f prime of g of x. Then I multiply by the derivative of g, which is 2x. And I would simplify this by saying, well, 2 times 2020 is 4040. I like putting my x first for some reason. So x times x squared plus 1 to the 2019. That's the form that I kind of like it in. Now, finally, I've got this last one, 1 over cosine of x. This might not look like a chain rule, so you might want to use the quotient rule, and you absolutely can. There's no problem using the, chain, the quotient rule here, but you know that I don't like the quotient rule, so I'll use the chain rule instead. I can think about this as the cosine of x all raised to the negative first power. And in this case, the first step in the process is finding the cosine of x. And the second step is taking the reciprocal, or raising to the negative 1 power. And now I can use the chain rule to say that the derivative is f prime, which is negative 1 times x to the negative 2. And I use g of x as my input, so cosine of x to the negative 2. And I multiply that by the derivative of g. And the derivative of g is negative sine of x. And what is this? This is sine of x divided by the cosine of x squared. And you'll see this in some books written in kind of a strange way. Sine of x over cosine of x squared is also equal to the tangent of x times the secant of x. And that's just some trigonometry. I think that this is a perfectly good answer, sine of x over cosine of x squared. 
But if you look in textbooks, I haven't checked ours recently, you might also see this written as tangent of x times the secant of x. This is kind of most common when I teach calculus to see it this way. But this is perfectly valid. So you might not see this as a chain rule, but look for these opportunities to use other strategies. And after some experience, you'll kind of learn which strategies are easiest in which situations. So now I'd like to take a look at derivatives for exponential functions with general bases and logarithmic functions with general bases. So this will be kind of an exponent logarithm review and some justifications for formulas that you might have to use. So what I mean by this is that we know the derivative of the function e to the x. It's remarkably simple. It's just e to the x again. But what about the derivative of a more general function like b to the x, where b is just a constant like 2 to the x or 17 to the x or something like that? It's not just b to the x. So this is something that works for e, and e is, remember, this special constant. It's about 2.7, 2.71. Uh, for general bases, like 2 to the x or 3 to the x, the derivative of the function is not just itself. They're different. But what we can do is we can say that b to the x, in fact, equals e raised to the x times the natural logarithm of b. And I'll remind you why. It's because if I look at e to the x times the natural logarithm of b, this is equal to e to the natural logarithm of b all raised to the x power. And e to the natural logarithm of b is just b itself. So that's why this is true. And using this, I can figure out the derivative the derivative of e to the x natural logarithm of b, I can figure out using the chain rule. This is um, a function e to the something and another function x times the natural logarithm of b. So via the chain rule, the derivative is e to the x natural logarithm of b times the derivative of what's in that exponent, which is just the natural logarithm of b. So this is a multiplication here. And I can simplify this because e to the x natural logarithm of b is b to the x. So the derivative of b to the x is b to the x times the natural logarithm of b. Notice that when b is e, I get e to the x times the natural logarithm of e, and the natural logarithm of e is 1. So this is why this is kind of a generalization of this rule that works for e. So what is the derivative of b to the x? It's b to the x times the natural logarithm of b. Now, the other case that's interesting is that we know the derivative of the natural logarithm of x, the logarithm base e. So remember, natural logarithm means the logarithm base e of x. And the derivative of this function is 1 over x. But what about the derivative of the logarithm base something else, like log base 2 of x or log base 10 of x? 
What about that logarithm? Well, it turns out, well, let's see what this is. We're going to use a similar trick. So up here, we figured this out by expressing b to the x in terms of e to the something else. Here we'll express log base b of x in terms of the natural log of something else. And so I claim, this is um, maybe a common identity, maybe you've seen it before, that the logarithm base b of x is equal to the natural logarithm of x divided by the natural logarithm of b. And I can think about this as a constant, 1 over natural logarithm of b. That's a constant times the natural logarithm of x. And so the derivative is the derivative of this function, which is 1 over x times this constant out in front. one over the natural logarithm of b times one over x, or I would write this as one over x natural logarithm of b. Okay, now where does this formula come from? The, the logarithm base b is the natural logarithm divided by the natural logarithm of b. Uh, let me give a derivation just in case you wanna know why. So why is this claim true? Well, it takes a few steps to show, but the key thing is to look at the following quantity. So first, notice that b raised to this power b raised to the natural logarithm of x over the natural logarithm of b, we can use this fact, b to any power is e to that power natural logarithm of b. This is e to the ln of x divided by the ln of b times ln of b, which is e to just the ln of b's cancel. That's e to the natural logarithm of x, which is just x. So miraculously, b to the natural logarithm of x divided by the natural logarithm of b is equal to x. And remember what the log base b means. Log base b of x equals the answer to, so this to answer this question we say b to the what equals x. So the question, maybe I didn't draw this clearly. If you want to ask the question, what is the logarithm base b of x? The equivalent question is b to the what equals x. And here is the what. b to the what equals x? The what is the natural logarithm of x divided by the natural logarithm of b. b to that what equals x. Therefore, the logarithm base b of x equals natural logarithm of x divided by the natural logarithm of b. Okay, so this is wh where this identity comes from. This is kind of a, maybe a convoluted argument for why this is true. But uh, using this fact, we can figure out the derivative of the logarithm base b of x for any base b. It's one over, it's not one over x, it's one over x times the natural logarithm of b. So I want to leave you today with one more technique of differentiation called logarithmic differentiation. And it's a little strange, uh, but it's useful for some peculiar examples that, that do actually show up now and then. So just to kind of warm up for this a little bit, I want you to think about the following. So maybe I'll make this a little table actually. So let's look at a few functions and their derivatives.
If I look at the function x squared, its derivative is 2x. If I look at a function like x cubed, the derivative is 3x squared. And if I look at a function like the square root of x, the derivative is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. If I look at a function like x to the pi power even, the derivative is pi x to the pi minus 1. These are all examples of the power rule. The power rule helps us when we want to find the derivative of a function of the form x to some constant power, r. Notice in each case I have x raised to a constant power. The constant is 2, 3. The square root of x is 1 half, so the power is 1 half. Here the power is pi. Still a constant is the key point here. On the other hand, we have functions like e to the x and 2 to the x. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of 2 to the x is 2 to the x times the natural logarithm of 2. In general, we have this maybe exponent rule. Actually, I don't know if this really has a name. But the derivative, the book probably gives this a name because they love naming things. The derivative of a function like b to the x is b to the x times the natural logarithm of b. This is when b is a positive constant. b must be positive, by the way, otherwise you get into trouble raising negative numbers to real powers. You get square roots of negative numbers, all sorts of bad things. So let's just make sure the constant is greater than zero. So notice that in the first batch of functions, I have a variable raised to the constant power. In the second batch of functions, I have a constant raised to a variable power. So this raises the question, what happens if I have a variable raised to a variable power? So for that, this technique of logarithmic differentiation really makes things work. So now let me show you how you use this. It's based on two principles. The first principle is that sometimes it's easier to find the derivative of the natural logarithm of a function instead of trying to figure out the derivative of the function directly. And the second principle is that if we know the derivative of the natural logarithm of the function, we can relate it to the derivative of the function itself because the derivative of the natural logarithm of f of x, by the chain rule, it's 1 over f of x times the derivative of f of x, or in other words, f prime of x over f of x. So let me show you how you use these principles to find the derivative of the function x to the x. So what is the derivative of x to the x power? So let me just make sure you realize, so it's not x times x to the x minus 1. And it's not x to the x times the natural logarithm of x. Here I've incorrectly applied the power rule, and it's incorrect because the exponent is not a constant, it's an x. And here I've incorrectly applied my little exponent rule, and it's incorrect because the base is not a constant b, it's a variable x. So what we do instead is we maybe start by giving this function a name. Let f of x equal x to the x. Then the natural logarithm of f of x, ln of f of x, is the natural logarithm of x to the x. And the natural logarithm of any exponent, like a to the b, is always the exponent times the natural logarithm of a. This is true for constants or variables or, or whatever. This is just something that's true about exponents and logarithms that it brings that exponent down like this. 
So this is equal to x times the natural logarithm of x. And when I look at this, I'm happy because I can take the derivative of this. So this is a case where this first principle is true. It's hard to find the derivative of the function when I see it like this. I can't use any of my rules. But the natural logarithm of the function, well, that's something I can take the derivative of. And now what I do is I take the derivative of both sides. If two functions are equal, then their derivatives are equal. On the left, I have the function natural logarithm of f of x. On the right, I have the function x times the natural logarithm of x. The derivative of the left side is f prime of x over x by the chain rule. And the derivative of the right, I use the product rule. This will be x times the derivative of the natural logarithm of x, which is x times 1 over x, plus the derivative of x, which is 1, times natural logarithm of x. And what is this? This is 1 plus the natural logarithm of x. Now, we haven't really solved the problem. We found the derivative of the natural logarithm, and it's equal to this. But what about the derivative of f itself? Well, let's multiply both sides by f of x. And I find that f prime of x is equal to 1 plus the natural logarithm of x times f of x. And we're just about done because, well, I know what f of x is. f of x is x to the x power. And so f prime of x is equal to 1 plus the natural logarithm of x times f of x, which is just x to the x itself. So when the function is x to the x, the derivative is 1 plus natural logarithm of x times x to the x. So this is the classic example of when you really need something powerful like logarithmic differentiation. This, I'd say, is like a good solid step deeper than any of the rules that we've seen so far, because we have to really transform the function before we figure out its derivative. But uh, in the end, we can find the derivative of x to the x, and it's not too difficult looking of a function, 1 plus natural logarithm of x, all times x to the x power.